Hello, hello, hello. Happy Shabbat. Trying something new today. Trying to use the camera on my laptop. I don't know how it's going to come out and look awful blurry. I done cleaned it and everything. But um, I never want to miss an opportunity to get the Shabbat teaching going. I just got back from dropping my daughter off at my at her baby brother's apartment. And it's raining and flood watch and everything. She's stuck now because I ain't going back out there while it's doing all that. Not that I'm scared. I just don't like to be wet. And it's humid and it's sticky. I don't like all of that. But for our topic today, we're going to talk about spiritual warfare. God knows how to give you just what you need. I was listening to Pastor Darius Daniels this week. And he was talking about it was an act of war. Matter of fact, I think I'm going to leave the... Uh, the link to the video in the comment, I mean, the description section. That way I can have proof because sometimes when I say something, certain people think that it's all about them, but it's not. It's whatever God gives me. So they say, some say if the shoe fit, wear it. But if it convicts you, shake it off, do what you got to do. And align, walk with God, do what you got to do. But I want to say that that message truly encouraged me for the things that I have been going through. And I'm not going to try to re-preach the whole thing, but it resonated with me. And there are certain things that, yeah, I have my own opinion on. So, like I say, today we're going to talk about spiritual warfare. You know, spiritual warfare is intentional. The enemy intentionally causes spiritual warfare in your life. When Christ walked the earth, it was to kill him, to take him down. Now, it is to stop your purpose. The distractions, the spiritual warfare, the things that keep coming at you to get you to come out of character. They, it comes at you to stop your purpose. And as long as you keep pressing forward and to the mark of the high calling and fulfill your purpose in life, you're going to make it in. But if you allow the enemy to thwart your purpose, thwart your, what you came was created for, then he done bamboozled you. So, and then I always say what the enemy meant for evil Oftentimes, God means for good. So the enemy may be doing something and causing you to be stopped. Like when he went to Jesus, you know, he, you know, had him crucified or whatever. But he meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. That's what we needed to have in order for him to shed his blood so that we might have life and life more abundantly. So. Sometimes the enemy is creating spiritual warfare to release you from some things. Let go and let God. Like I say, we're going to talk about spiritual warfare today. Our text is going to come from Luke 22. Um, it's pretty much the whole chapter. But for the sake of time and for your hearing, we're going to go... Uh, we're just going to read verses um, 1 through 7. Let's take on verses Luke 22, verses 1 through 7. And it reads as thus. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Issachariot, being of the number of the twelve. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad and covenanted, covenanted to give him money. And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. Then came 
the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. So this is where Jesus, you know, pretty much the Last Supper. You know, he's with the, the 12 disciples. He's having the Last Supper. And, well, actually, I think it's before. But this is where Judas betrays Jesus. He puts him over into the hands of the scribes and the Pharisees. And what Pastor Darius Daniels was saying was that he had preached this on Holy Week. And he had seen something that he had never seen before in all the time that he had been preaching. And he brought it to my attention too. It's something I had never seen before. And one of the thing parts is, is that Judas solicited the chief priests and scribes. He solicited to betray Jesus. So, it wasn't so much the chief priests and scribes was coming at to get Jesus. Judas solicited. How did he solicit it? After Satan entered him, he was one of the 12. See, Satan didn't enter the chief priests or the scribes. He entered the one that was close to Jesus. He entered the one that, well, G Judas was the treasurer. He entered that one. So, you know, he's among the 12. He's close to him. So that, you know, he looked like he belonged. The enemy is going to come into your life not looking like a serpent. Not looking like a dragon. Not looking like that he don't belong or he's set off. So we always looking for the stranger or something to come do something. The enemy is always going to use somebody that's close to you. It's always going to use somebody in your circle. Somebody that you're familiar with. Somebody that you have some type of relation with. So that's the reason why, like he was saying, Pastor Daniels was saying, the serpent was able to convince or deceive Eve because he looked like he belonged. He, he, he was a serpent, a snake in the garden. Snakes to hang out in the garden. Had he come like a dragon in the garden, she wouldn't have talked to him. So... We need to stop looking for people that have no relation to us, that are unfamiliar. You know, our best friend is our worst enemy. So, because that's the one Satan is going to enter in, going to use. When people are going through something, we don't know how much they can take. God does, because God knows their heart. Sometimes, well, I'm going to say, everybody ain't going to be like Job, where the enemy was able to hit him on all sides. You know, took his, his, got into his wife, took his children, his house, his possessions, his cattle, took everything. And he took it and he still didn't curse God. Whereas Judas cursed God. He, he came against him. Judas was going through some things. Judas, like I said, he was the treasurer. There, is something about a spirit, you know, with money. Money is a spirit. You know, those that have money, they have a particular spirit on them. You know, they feel like they can buy anything. They can get themselves out of any kind of trouble. You know, as long as they got money sitting in the bank, there ain't nothing that they can't buy their way out of. You know, they don't look for money because they got it all sitting in the bank. They look for power. They want to control things. Here we go talking about the narcissist. Narcissists seek money. They seek power and control so that they can control others. You know, they can have their way and do what they want to do. That reeks a spirit of jealousy. Judas obviously was jealous. I can imagine he was tired of seeing Jesus doing certain things, that he was tired of seeing Jesus healing the people and getting all the glory, getting all the credit. He was tired of being subservient to Jesus. He walking around holding the bag, but Jesus is the one that's out in the forefront getting all the credit, doing everything, you know, everybody coming to him. You know, Judas got tired of feeling like a servant, you know, or maybe Jesus wasn't raking in enough money. So he got tired, you know, in I'm pretty sure Jesus saw him stealing money because 
he needed 30 shekels of silver. Let's say, well, let's just say he wanted money because they covenanted, they made a contract, they made an agreement with Judas to pay him for his services of betraying Jesus. So that was the issue. Judas accepted money to betray our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that right there shows you that Judas had a problem with Jesus. He didn't look at the things that he did, you know, the healing and, you know, the good things that he did, you know, the wonders, the signs that he did, you know, he didn't look at him as the son of God. He wanted to be the son of God. He wanted the credibility. He wanted to be the one out in front. He wanted more money. He wanted to have control. He didn't like people, you know, giving accolades and compliments to Jesus. So he got tired of it. He was jealous. He had envy on the inside of him. He, that was a breach. That was a crack. So what happened? Satan saw that. He knew that. And what he did is he came in and he entered Judas. People go through things and they may be your best friend and you don't know what they're going through and you can't really blame them for what they do. Even Jesus said, forgive them for they don't know what they know not what they do because a lot of them are entered by Satan. What happened in the Bible still happens today. People are going through stuff. They tired. They envious. They jealous. They want your position. They want, you know, the, the money that you have. They want the smile on your face. They want the prestige. They want the a credibility. They want your spot. And Jake, Satan interests them. So that's when they have a Judas experience, like Pastor Daniels was saying, a Judas experience where they just get so fed up and they get so tired to where they want to get rid of you. It's time to, you know, it's time to off you. Just get rid of you. I'm sick of looking at you. I'm sick of hearing you. I'm sick of looking at how, you know, I'm sick of looking at her Cadillac. I'm sick of looking at how her, how she flowing. I'm sick of looking at her, you know, not living a stress, stressful life. I'm, I'm just sick. So Satan enters into Judas. Judas, surname is a carrot. You know, there's more than one Judas, but the one that's named is a carrot. He entered into him. You know, there's a particular person that Satan enters into. We'll go on to that later. Um, but that's a whole nother message, actually. He was a, one of the 12. Like I said, he's going to enter in somebody that's close. He's going to have access to you in order for him to do what he wants to do. Because, see, his main tool is heartache, heartbreak. If he can break your heart, he maybe can get you to curse God. If he can break you down, he got an opportunity to get you to curse God. So, and the chief priests and scribes saw how they might kill him for they feared the people. The chief priests, they wanted Jesus gone. They wanted him dead. They didn't want to have to deal with him anymore because he was preaching a message that everybody else wasn't preaching. He was preaching a message that they wasn't preaching. The chief priests and scribes, they had money. So therefore, Jesus was preaching a message that was hitting a pocketbook, that was keeping them from obtaining and doing the things that they wanted to do. They wanted the power. They wanted the accolades. They wanted to be the chief priests. But with Jesus on the scene, the, he was the cornerstone. He was the chief priest. He was the king of kings and lord of lords. And they got tired. They had been the chief priests and getting all the credit all this time. And then here come this Jesus, 
Who is this Jesus to come and take us down, to come and take our, what we trying to do, to come and thwart our program, what we got going on. So this Jesus is teaching something that ain't nobody else teaching. This Jesus is, is promoting love and, you know, trying to feed people and trying to clothe people. But these chief priests and scribes, they trying to clothe themselves and trying to fill their own pocketbooks. So they sought to kill him. Jesus came teaching the truth. He was setting the captives free. He was, you know, having the blind to see, the deaf to hear. These chief priests and the scribes, most people with money, they want to keep you down. They want to keep you in that situation because if they keep you in that situation, they can keep raking money from you. How dare they heal you? How dare, you know, they, that's what I was talking about before. My, um, my clinical say we are in the business of what, what is, what, how I forgot how she said we in the business of work. We, we work to make our, so we don't have any business. In other words, we work to heal people. And when we heal people, we don't have no more clients. We don't have no more units. But if we know that there's more people, we don't have to keep people down. We don't have to keep people sitting there on medic medication and, you know, lead them to the psychiatrist so we can keep sitting there and running out all their units. This is the chief priests and the, and the scribes. They want to keep you in that situation. They want to keep preaching that same old thing while they fill in their pockets and doing what they want to do. They want to kill Jesus because he's doing too good. Everybody looking at him. Ain't nobody paying no attention to them no more. Everywhere he go, he got multitudes. And when he come out of his house or come out of his tent or wherever he was, the multitudes are sitting there waiting to, to come to him. They always want to get with him. They want to be where he is. They want to follow him. Wasn't nobody following the chief priests and the scribes anymore. They were all following Christ. So they was jealous and envious. They wanted to get rid of him. You got to be careful. The people around you, they want to get rid of you. If they can't get you to move and do what they want you to do, if they can't have control over you to get you to lead and do what they want you to do, they done with you. They ain't got no purpose for you. They want to get rid of you. Just go on. Go on about your business. Do what you got to do. So they feared the people. They feared that if they killed him, that the people was going to kill them. That the people was going to go after them. That's how you know you got credibility and clout. You know, when they want to kill you, want to get rid of you, but they too scared to do it because they scared the people, your followers is going to come and, and take care of them. I'm, I'm saying, I like how Pastor Daniels preached it, but God has given me a whole new revelation. Then enter Satan into Judas, named surname Issachar, being of the number of the twelve. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains, how he might betray him unto them. Like I say, and Pastor Daniel say, Judas went and solicited the chief priests and the captains. He went and sought them out. Remember, they was too scared. They wanted to kill him, but they were scared of the people. But Judas went and sought them out how he might betray them. Betray him unto them. He was going to hand them over. Jesus took care of them, clothed them, fed them. Jesus, all the, the whole trip, he was the one that, you know, provision came from. They didn't have to want for nothing. And Judas wanted to betray him. And I'm sure, like Pastor Daniel say, how dare you? Of all the people that you had could be betrayed, of all the people that you want to do this to, why you want to do it to me? That kind of thing. But when Satan enters a person, it's confusion. They don't even understand why they do it themselves. I can attest to that because later on in scriptures, 
you'll find Judas felt sorrow and he gave, he threw the money back at him, the shekels back at them because he realized that what he done, he shouldn't have done because at that part, Satan wasn't in him no more. See, Satan will enter into these people. Satan will enter into you and get you and cause you to do something to somebody. And then after it's done, he ain't going to stay with you to suffer the consequences. No, he going to go and leave you to deal with it by yourself. You dealing with the sorrow. In Judas's case, he went and commit, committed suicide because he knew what he did was wrong. It was a sorrow that's worse than a heartbreak. It's worse than a pain. Sorrow was something that he could not get over. And he would rather die than sit and live with that. Than sit and experience that. You can do something to somebody. And touch the one that God got his hand on. And sorrow can come over your life. To where you can't even fathom. Or you can't even live anymore. Because you can't get over that deep set guilt of, of your actions, your behavior, and what you've done. Sorrow. I can attribute that to some of the stories that I hear from women that have committed an um, abortion. They have killed their child because whatever reason that they make they it up in their mind that they can't do it or, you know, for whatever reason, they make up their mind, they abort their child, and they feel this sorrow, and they never forget the life that they had on the inside of them and that they aborted. I know women, and I counsel women, and we have to talk them through and, you know, get them to, you know, you can't change the past. You can't. You have to still be able to function and live in this world despite the consequences and the decisions that we make. So we don't want to cast judgment. We want to give them grace. We want to keep them on this side of the earth. We don't want them going out committing suicide themselves. But sorrow is a, a deep set guilt that a lot of people can't get over. They just can't. We got pastors committing suicide for whatever reason. It's it's something when you want to take your own life. That's when Satan then entered into you. And the sorrow becomes too great. To where you would rather be dead than to continue to live in that state of mind. In that state of being. I'm trying to tell you. Spiritual warfare is real. It is your, the enemy messing with your mind and your mindset so... To the point where it convinces your soul to do something that you would have not done on your own. To do something to cancel your purpose. To cancel your stay, your lot here on the earth. That's how deep set it can get. So, let's go on to back to the text. And how he put, betrayed them, him unto them. And they were glad and covenant covenanted to give him money. That's why they, they was trying to figure it out themselves. They didn't know how to do it. And then the enemy delivered an answer into their hand. They can't say God delivered that answer because God don't do that. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Pay attention to the people in your life that's in your circle that when they're around, it's always confusion or drama, or it's always costing you something, or it's always taking something from you, or, you know, they're competitive. Like he was saying in that video, pay attention to the competition. Stop looking over it. Ain't nothing a coincidence. Ain't nothing by happen chance. You know, they may not be competitive in your face, but you don't know what they're thinking in their heart. You know, Everybody ain't happy for you. Everybody don't, I mean, they can say good, you know, about your accolades, but deep down on the inside, they may not be happy for you. 
They may be trying to take you, cut your neck off. They may be trying to cut you at the ankles because they want what you got. They feel like you can't, they, they can't get it themselves. They want to wipe the smile off your face. So pay attention to those around you that's smiling in your face. Make sure, you know, if you can, find out if they're not smiling, if they smiling behind your back. Because oftentimes, they're not smiling behind your back. They gossiping. They backbiting. They talking about you. They telling you, you know, they, they, they want, oh, I could wish, I could get her down. I could kill her. I'm sick of seeing the Cadillac. I'm sick of seeing, you know, uh, she, the money, she a single mom, the life she living. I'm sick of hearing about it. Pay attention. You know, those messages that come to you, like they came to Job. Everything that happened, there was always one that survived to come and tell him the answer, to come and give him the message. That one was saved by God to let you know. Start paying attention to the messages that come to you. Start paying attention to what is being brought to you, what is being said. There have been things that happened in my life that God has showed me where the root of it came from. And who the root of it came from. So pay attention to who's, what's coming to you. Trust and believe is coming to you for a reason. It's coming to open your eyes, to shed light on some things. Pay attention. He that hath an ear, let him hear. He that have eyes, let him see. Pay attention. They're not coming to you for just any old thing. Don't just brush it off or blow it off. It's coming to you for a reason. It might be coming to warn you of something. It might be coming so that you can get away from a certain individual. And if we just pay attention, sometimes we can deal with, and we don't have to go through some of the things that we go through. But sometimes we just, oh, they, they ain't nothing. That, that That's just, that's, you know, we just blow it off. Ain't nothing but happenstance. Ain't nothing a coincidence. Just because you can't see it don't mean it ain't there. You can't see radio waves, but you can turn a transmitter on and hear the waves that's been going through your body, going through the atmosphere. I can't hear nothing right now, but if I turn on Amazon or, or the radio or anything, I can hear. What, because that transmitter has a discernment of the radio waves, the sound waves. In another dimension. I'm trying to tell you. Stop brushing everything off. Spiritual warfare is real. Spiritual warfare is the thing behind the thing. When people come at you, it's the, the spirit behind the thing. It ain't them. That's why we can't go at them. We can't take their head off because we take that head off, kill that spirit, kill that soul. We ain't killing the spirit. They just jump up, jump in somebody else. I'm trying to tell you. Stop looking over things that come into your life. They come into your life for a reason. It's time to have a discernment. You wouldn't have to go through so much stuff. You wouldn't have to lose so much stuff if you would just pay attention, if you would just listen. Spiritual warfare. They have some things come into my life and cut me loose of some things. Things that I didn't even know I needed to be cut loose from. I just listen. I don't fight. I just listen. And whatever cut me loose, I just, I, I stay with God. I listen to God. If he want me to fight for it, then I'll fight for it. If he don't, I go on by my business. And I say all the time, behind your Goliath, behind that thing that's fighting you, behind the enemy that's coming at you, is your greatest blessing. It's the door you're supposed to run into. I'm trying to say, I don't know who this is for, but I have walked into a beautiful door. Matter of fact, a few beautiful doors. So don't pay attention or sit and wonder why this happened or that happened. Just know that God happened.
Can't nothing happen in your life that God don't allow. And he allows it because he knows that you are able or capable of handling it. Just know that when the enemy shows up, that season is over. That's your test. You got to pass that test in order to walk into your new, your new season. That's all you need to know is that you got to walk into your new season. So, and he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. See, that's another thing. Even Pastor Daniels made comment on is the enemy wants to do stuff with you by yourself. He don't want to do stuff in front of everybody. That way he don't want to, uh, let's say he want to appear to be integral. But when you by yourself and there's no witnesses around, he can act the way he want to act, do what he want to do. Be in places that you, that would offend somebody else. But he has the opportunity to betray the people, but in the absence of the multitude. He don't want to be seen. He don't want to be found out. He wants to be looked upon as this perfect one, this angelic being. You know, they say he was a beautiful angel. Music. He comes to us in the music. But if you pay attention to some of these words, especially some of these nursery rhymes, it ain't too angelic. rock a -bye baby in on the in the treetop. Come on now. The cradle falls. I'm trying to say, these nursery rhymes, if you listen to them, you wouldn't say them to your children. You wouldn't implant that in your head. But he always want to look a certain way amongst the people. But when he got you by yourself, it's a whole different story. It's, it's, it's double-faced it. It's two-faced it. It's double-minded. So, in the absence of the multitude, pay attention to the ones that act one way with you, but then act a, a different way with somebody else. I was listening to a young lady who was saying that an individual was constantly coming to her for one thing, but acting like he was all that in a bag of chips in front of everybody else. Pay attention. That's narcissistic as a matter of fact. Anyway, verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. We're talking about the Passover, the Last Supper. As you go on down, you find Peter. Jesus tell Peter that you're going to deny me three times. I mean, these are people that's close to him. You saying all of this, but I know you. Jesus saw something in him. He said, you're going to deny me three times. And he did. He said, you're going to deny me three times before the crow, the, before the crow speaks, the rooster, the crow speaks three times. So he called him out on that. He even told Judas that there's going to be one that's going to betray me. That's why you got to discern. You got to pay attention to who's around you. Jesus himself even went into the garden of Gethsemane and he asked the father to let the cup pass from him because in the flesh, he did not want to go through what he knew he had to go through, what he knew that he was created or came to do. Even the Lord and savior was in the flesh. The flesh was so strong in trying to take over his spirit. But he said, not my will, but thy will be done. He gave it to God. There are leaders that go through things 
and in their secret place in their prayer closet, they asking God to take this cup from me to, I don't want to deal with these people no more. I don't want to deal with what's going on. I don't want to fight with this one or that one. When you trying to get the vision going and, you know, have ministry flow, you got those that got their own opinion and they don't want to bend and they don't want to bow, you know, to the vision of God. They just want to do what they want to do. Or they want you to do all the work while they go off and do whatever they want to do. There are pastors that are praying, let this cup pass from me. Some of them can't handle it. And that's why you hear the pastors that's committing suicide. So Jesus was an example of that too. But do we even listen to that part? Do we look at that part? No, a lot of us don't. Because we feel that the leader or the pastor or the one that's called is supposed to be, I guess, perfect. They, a lot of pastors don't get no grace. They ain't supposed to make no mistakes because they called by God. God didn't call the, the perfect. He called the vessel that he could use. He called King David who broke every rule in the Bible or in every rule, every word of God. So he don't call the swift he don't call the very elite or the very elect. He calls the willing. He calls the one that, you know, ain't high up on theyself. David, like we, I just talked about David. He was the man after God's own heart because he knew he was wrong. He knew he didn't do things right. He knew he did things in his own decision, in his own way, but he had a repentive heart. He was quick to repent. Very quick. He was quick to come to repent and melt God's heart and God didn't take, didn't kill it for the things that he was doing. So we got people that will walk amongst Jesus, saw him do the works, do the wonders, you know, heal the sick, raise the dead. And they still weren't convinced or they still felt that they was privileged to do whatever they could do. They weren't convicted enough not to do the things that they weren't to do. They weren't convicted enough to walk in spirit and in truth or the straight and narrow, let's just say. They had the word walking with them, but there were still times when they stepped out and did what they wanted to do. They didn't, they wasn't led by the word. They stepped away from Jesus, who was the word. And he was the word made flesh. But they didn't pay no attention to that. They were still in the flesh and did what they wanted to do. So if you find, if, if they could do that back then, and Jesus is only here in the spirit, he's supposed to be in our hearts, amongst us, in our hearts, in, in vessels, People ain't going to be perfect. If the disciples weren't perfect walking with him, why doesn't the pastors today get grace? The pastor better not mess up. The pastor better not do nothing. The pastor make a decision. And then there's no accountability because the pastor can make a, a decision but everybody got their free will. The people don't have no gun to their head. The people can say no. They say no any other time. But when it's time to be held accountable, the people don't say no. And then they find themselves bamboozled in a situation and they want to blame the pastor. Like it's all they fault. They could have blamed, they could have said no. And with Jim Jones. They could have said no. You had some that did. You had some that went over there, found themselves in a paradise, in a, in a jungle in Africa, and then got a revelation and started hiding up under the beds and started hiding somewhere. And, and, and you know, they didn't drink the juice. They got way over there. 
and, and change their mind and exercise their free will. I don't care what it is. You still have your free will. So if you find yourself bamboozled, it's because you didn't take accountability. Nobody forces anybody to do anything. Nobody forces me to sit here every Saturday and go through this word. God don't even force me. It's just my calling. It's just what he told me to do. You know, people are listening. There are people that are hungry for the word. I get feedback from people. 500 subscribers. That's across all social media platforms. The last time I looked, I haven't looked in, in a while. So people are hungry for the word. But they can take the word and chew on it and show their own self-approved. And they can agree and they can disagree. They can agree to disagree. But when people do not take accountability for their own actions and blame the pastor, that ain't on the pastor. That's on them. Because when it's all said and done and they get to that great day, God going to look at them and judge them for what they did or what they didn't do. So I can't blame Judas. I can only blame myself. I can't blame Eve. I can only blame myself. I can't blame my parents. I can only blame myself. I got to be accountable because I have free will to do what thus saith the Lord. Despite what anybody else does in my life, I know right from wrong. So, like I said, Judas was held accountable. Matter of fact, he's the one who put this in perspective, he was entered in by Satan. He could have said no, but he was weak. When Satan entered into him, his flesh took over. His spirit, we are spiritual beings. We're not flesh. We're not our mind. We are spiritual beings. Our spirit is what's going to live in eternity. Not this flesh. So when Satan entered into his flesh, Judas allowed his flesh to take over. He, Satan convinced his mind. Judas, led by his mind, crucified our Christ or had our Christ crucified. Gave up our Christ. He had to pay for that. And he started paying for that before he even died because the sorrow... Like I said, I just talked about that. The sorrow was too much. And he killed himself. He killed himself. That's how bad it was. So he had to be accountable even before he even met God. Even before he even, let's say, met judgment. Because he walked with God. He crucified. He led God. Jesus, who was God in the flesh, to be crucified. Now, there are a lot of religions that come up with the same story. You know, it's the greatest story ever told in different languages. In one language is Jesus, Jesus in another language is something else, in another language is something else. But in the King James Version, his name is Jesus. For those that want to come at me, Talking about his name wasn't Jesus. I understand from Hebrews to Negroes. I understand we are the children of Israel. I understand we are the chosen ones. But from the book that I'm reading here, this is what I have to interpret. Besides, if I go any deeper, you two be willing to shut me down. So it's good for those that do study to show their own self approved to understand that there are lost books and there are other things or doctrines that's out there that tells the story and 
You know, there are things that we've been lied to. You know, they ain't teaching the real truth in the schools. And that's about as far as I'm going to go with that right there. But the story tends to remain the same as it goes across all the translations, as it goes across all the religions. When you read the stories, they all basically the same. In this book, his name is Jesus. In Psalms, God's name is Yah. There was no J's in Hebrew. Matter of fact, it was brought on. I forget the man's name who created the J. So, before we get spun out on that, in the King James Version of the book, we talk about Jesus and Judas. But, I understand that we are the children of Israel. I understand that there's a whole nother doctrine or a whole nother story behind the story. Let's continue. All I want to say is the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Pay attention to who's in your life. Are they edifying you? Or are they costing you everything? Or are they stripping you dry? When they come around, are they draining you dry? Do you feel edified? Do you feel full? Or do you feel like you can't keep up with stuff? That, that life is just fleeting. People come into your life for a reason. You got to be have a spirit of discernment. And like I say, people can go through things and the enemy can enter any anybody. I'm not, you know, God ain't respect a person. You know, the, the enemy ain't respect a person either. I could be entered in too. You know, that's why I try to stay with God. I try to stay in the word. I have multiple things that I have to do concerning the word of God during the week because it keeps my mind stayed on him because I don't want to be weak. I don't want to be in a place where the enemy can enter into me and I jump in my flesh and deal with situations in my flesh. I try to stay in like Jesus, the garden of Gethsemane where I can bring my woes and my cares to him. But at the end of the, the, the venting, at the end of the bringing it to him, I still say, not my will, but thy will be done. That's why I have to say, Judas didn't do that. He allowed the, Satan to enter into him, and he was sitting right there with Christ. He could have said, he could have talked to him right then. But no, he, he, he stepped off into his flesh. So, matter of fact, in here, later on, down the way, while Jesus was in there, he told them to pray so that he would, they wouldn't uh, deal with temptation, so they wouldn't be tempted. They went to sleep. And he said, you can't pray for me while I'm So they wouldn't be tempted. Because if you don't keep your mind and your eyes focused on Christ, there's an opportunity that you could be tempted. So they were sleeping and Judas was out with the scribes. I mean, yeah, the chief priests and the fair, and scribes. He was out hanging out with them. He was already tempted. While Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane, he just, instead of wanting to pray, he got up, he was out with them, seeking to betray Jesus while he was in there, asking the Lord, you know, let this cup pass from me. He loved the people. He was in love with the people. And he died of a broken heart. He loved the people. He didn't want to go through that. A broken heart is something a lot of us don't want to go through because it's so devastating. 
when it happens, it breaks us. Most of us, after a heartbreak, we don't come back the same. We come back with a new perspective. You know, we don't act the same way. We don't allow the same things. You know, that's if you learn your lesson. If not, you keep on getting your heart broke and you continue to go around Mount Sinai 40 years. The cycles of life. Because you don't learn from your the, the, the life experiences. Or I'm going to say the experiences that life give you. You don't learn from it. So, we don't come back the same after a heartbreak. We don't, whatever the enemy did to us to get our heart to break, we don't come back in a position where he can do it again. That's called a level of maturity. So, when you go through something, you're supposed to mature. Get up. Shake yourself off, dust yourself off, and get back out there. If you sit and wallow in it, the enemy won. Now, there's scripture that says you're supposed to forgive quick. You can forgive quick, but that don't mean you got to be in their face. I say that all the time. It's hard to forgive somebody and you in their face, and they constantly doing the same thing. They constantly over and over and over. They, I'm sorry, but they do it again. Or they, I'm sorry, but they still in the position of doing it. They still stabbing you. They saying, I'm sorry, but while they stabbing you in the back. So there's some bold enough to stab you in your face. So it's hard to forgive somebody while you look at them and you're bleeding. Sometimes you got to create space so that you can heal. Scripture says some water, some plant, but God gives the increase. So maybe all you were supposed to do was water in their life. Maybe all you were supposed to do was plant in their life. But you ain't got to stay there because God will give the increase. God will deal with that individual. The spiritual warfare is not really the individual. It's the spirit that they allow to let inside of them. They going through stuff. And while they are attacking you, you can't do nothing for them no way. They can't receive you. They can't hear from you. They can't do nothing with you. Because they are an offense against you. So while they're conducting spiritual warfare against you, your best bet is to shake the dust. Scripture says that if they don't receive you, when you walk into their house, when you walk into their life, when you walk in their presence, that's what that means. When you walk before them and they don't receive you, you're supposed to turn around and shake the dust at the front door. That leaves a curse upon them. So don't allow people to just continually to hurt you, to bamboozle you, to commit spiritual warfare on you. Because if you take a hammer and continue to beat somebody, or be, let's say beat a countertop in the same spot over and over and over and over, you're going to eventually wear it down. The same way with us. If they continually beat us, over and over and over, they're going to continue to wear us down and break our heart. So you get tired of hearing the same old thing. You get tired of going through the same old thing. You get tired of being in situations to where you find it up with the same result. That means it's time for you to do something different. That's insanity. It's time to move. It's, it's, it's time to cause change. If you are finding yourself in the same predicament, I don't care if the enemy changes faces. You know, you had this with one person and then you end up with another person, the same old cycle happens, the same old thing. You find yourself in the same old position. It's time to move. 
It's time to it's that's something in you. It's time for first time shame on me on you. Second time shame on me. It's time to move. It's time to go somewhere else, do something else different. Because obviously that cycle is in your life. It's something that the enemy is attacking or attaching to in your life. Spiritual warfare comes from within. It's something that the enemy sees within you. And within you is your spirit. The enemy comes to break your spirit. And if you continually allow yourself to be in this place or in the presence of an individual or individuals, S, plural, that is constantly breaking your spirit, then you're accustomed to pain. You just love being a pain. For example, a domestic violence situation. A woman that keeps going back to her husband who constantly beats on her. That's something wrong in her. She feel like she can't fix it for herself. She feel like she can't take care of herself. She feel like she can't move on, get her own apartment and do good for herself. To where she would sit there and go over and over and over and over. Trying to make that please that man, make him happy. But it doesn't work. Because he's not happy within himself. Therefore, I don't care what she does or what she doesn't do. He's not going to be happy. He's going to wake up and he's going to slap the taste out of her mouth anytime he feel like he ain't happy. He ain't angry with her. He angry with himself. Some of them don't like their mama. And they take it out on their girl. For whatever reason why he angry. I don't care what she do. And usually, sad, it ends up in... Somebody dying. Generally, it's the woman that tried all she could to be the best wife she could be so that he can stop beating on her. So that he could stop whooping on her. When all she had to do was walk away. Because it's not her fault. That problem is in him. He's broken on the inside. Nothing ever happens right in his life because he's broken on the inside. And when things don't go right in his life, he goes home and takes it out on his wife. Well, whoever close, significant other, whatever, he takes it out on the woman that he's with. Who's ever close to him, that's who he takes it out on him. Because things don't happen right in his life. You know, when a man takes it out on his wife, he's, he's basically taking it out on himself because that's one body. So, he ain't going to stand up there and beat himself. Generally, they don't. If they do, that's mental illness. But, and it's still mental illness if he beat on the woman. But generally, they go home and they beat on the wife because things didn't go right in their life. They still broken. They didn't heal some things on the inside of them. They can't find happiness on the inside of them because they never got to know who they were. I heard a quote the other day that said, I think I heard it from Wayne Dyer. And he said the thing, I don't know if he was the one who did the quote, but he said the thing, the problem with most people is that they can't learn to sit alone by themselves. There are some people that can't sit by themselves. They don't like themselves. They don't know themselves. They got so much anxiety and stuff running through them. I would find out why I couldn't sit by myself. I would find out who I am. What's wrong with me that I can't even take myself out to lunch? That I can't do something for myself? I love myself. That's why I spend time with myself. I love spending time with myself. <laughs> That's my problem is I love spending time with myself. I like doing the Uber and Lyft because for basically 20, 30 minutes is the longest I have them people in my car. It's like an elevator speech. I create an atmosphere, you know, to take them wherever they want to go. And I interact with them, you know, give words of encouragement you know, they know who I serve but by the time they get out of my car. But I don't have to take them home. I don't have to do nothing else with them. 
just take a, pick them up, drop them off, and go on about my business. When you start dealing with people on a long-term basis, when you start dealing with people and making covenants with them, that's when you got problems. I used to have social anxieties to where I wouldn't even deal with them at all. But I can't preach the gospel or lead people to Christ if I don't deal with them at all. So now I deal with them on my terms. Free will. I have them in the car for however long the ride is. And I drop them off. We have a wonderful experience. Tips flying. Compliments, feedback flying. I did my due diligence. And I come home to a, a home empty right now. Because like I said, I dropped my daughter off at her baby brother's apartment. <laughs> and I can share my peace and quiet. Me and God. I sit here and deal with all the subscribers and all the viewers. You know, you can pick and choose your battles. You ain't got to be in front of people. I just decided that I was done with the organization. I just decided that I'm going to do, I'm just going to keep my peace. I'm going to guard my heart. Let's just say that. I'll pop out every now and then, but I'm not going to put myself in a position to be bamboozled anymore. So spiritual warfare is something that is attached with only it attaches to something on the inside of you it's a weakness a breach of something on the inside of you it's somewhere where where the enemy can get in what is he using can he get in through gossip through backbiting what area of your life can the enemy come in and cause you to fall what area of life and you know the enemy is all around you when you experience all this negativity. I know the enemy is around me when my blood sugar gets high. You know, maybe I'm getting weak. Maybe I ain't in the word as much. I need to be in the word a little bit more. Maybe I, you know, I'm, I'm doing stuff and I ain't in the word as much as I need to be. So I'm, I'm in the, I need to get in the word more. Maybe God is trying to gear me up or prepare me for something that's about to happen. So my, my blood sugar, like a gauge, you know, you dealing with issues and health issues. I'm in you praying and your health issues. I was talking to a friend and I was letting, you know, you got to break away from some things. You got to, you are connected to something that God is trying to get your attention and you need to disconnect from that thing so that God can bless you. So if you got all manner of hell and evil around you, chaos, confusion around you, the Prince of Peace ain't there. You need to make sure that you get to where the Prince of Peace is. Like I was teaching my, my uh, Bible study, you got to get grounded. You got to get focused. You got to pull yourself away from stuff. You got to be in reality in the present. Sometimes you got to sit in a seat. Like I'm sitting in this seat and feel the leather. Feel your toes. You know, get your focus. Bring everything back to you. Get your focus right. Bring it back to the word of God. And then let God propel you from there. Don't just keep going topsy-turvy, being overwhelmed. Life just happening to you. Spiritual warfare is intentional. It's not by, by chance. It's not, you know, coincidence. Things happen for a reason. You need to find out what that reason is. Stop just looking over it. Stop just saying, oh, that's just nothing. That's why the enemy gets a foothold in your life because you can constantly looking over stuff. And as you looking over stuff, he breaking you down piece by piece. So eventually you find yourself in pieces. I'm just saying. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. 
Are you experiencing that in your life? Or are you experiencing life more abundantly? That's Jesus. John 10 and 10. The enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He said, but I come so that you may have life and life more abundantly. If you're not having life more abundantly, if you're going through stuff, that means God is trying to get your attention. Maybe you need to disconnect from some things. Maybe you need to add some things into your life. Maybe there's something that you need to do. Maybe there's some forgiveness that need to be done. There's something that's connected to your spirit that ain't right. You need to walk in spirit and in truth. And in walking in spirit and in truth, the truth going to come to set you free. You got to allow that truth to come and set you free. No matter how bad or how hard it hurts you. Most of us dealing with pride. You know, the pride of life. The pride of the eye. The lust of flesh. You know, we living in the flesh. You know, that arrogance. Our ambition. You know, we want to be more than we are. A bag of chips. We need to humble ourselves and get back to God. Let him use our vessel instead of us taking him around like he's our, a, a co-pilot. You know, he ain't nobody, buddy. He going to be, he say, he going to be head of all or none of all. So, if you won't, Life more abundantly, you got to get back in the word. You got to not only read the word, study the word, but you got to apply that word to your life. You ain't got no business sitting around hating, being jealous on somebody else, creating a breach or a space where Satan can enter into you to cause you to do something that is against God against your sister or your brother, all because you ain't in your word and applying that word to your life to achieve the very thing that you want, that you desire. The same thing that that individual has that you, that they, I'm sure they did to get if they are in the word. Now, there are people that got the money just to go buy it. I ain't one of those ones. People say, you know, good job and everything. I don't have a good job. I don't have that many clients. I'm an independent contractor. I'm out here on grace. If God don't provide it, I don't have it. God supplies all my needs according to his riches and glory. God keeps me in this. I'm living, I ain't gonna say I'm living paycheck to paycheck, but I'm living God the glory of God, I'm living glory to glory. I'm out here, I got to be out here doing things. And I say hustling, side hustles. That's my company, side hustles. I got to be out here side hustling to make sure ends is me. And that means I go out and say whatever God want me to do, wherever God want me to go. He provides the income, he provides the clients, he provides the increase. I sit in my car, turn my light on, the, the, wherever they show up. I sit in my office. The intakes come in. Whoever, I, you know, there's more than one therapist there. Whoever he sends me. So I don't have a job or a clock that I punch. Well, I got this guaranteed, you know, hours, you know, like I did when I was on the school district. I punched that clock as long as I was on that school bus and my wheels was turning, I was guaranteed to get a check. Well, as you supposed to, but there became time when they started having budget cuts and they was cutting that out too. So that ain't guaranteed. But I don't have that. I live out here on grace. The lifestyle that I have that I live, God keeps it and I mean that. He keeps it at any given time. He can blow. It did all be going away. I was saying the other day, and I'm going to close with this. I was saying the other day that I was in a car. I remember a few years ago, a couple of years ago, 
where I was saying that I was tired and ended up in the same situation with this industry. I can't say that no more. Because I did what God say do. I handled some situations. I got some toxicity out of my life. And I don't have to deal with that anymore. And God just flowing. I don't have to, you know, struggle in that area anymore. So, I thank God for the people that God has brought into my life. I thank God for each and every soul that he's brought into my life. I've even thanked God for the ones that he's brought back into my life. Um, it was truly a blessing to talk to a gentleman who has the intellect, who is so deep, <laughs> but I understand. And I can't put that out here because everybody ain't that deep. It would go over people's head. But he got a, a spin on the movie, The Wizard of Oz, that not too many people can understand. So, it's all an illusion. The only thing that real that's real is what that thing that doesn't change, and that's your spirit. The spirit of God doesn't change. Your flesh changes. It grows old, you know. You ashy, it, it departs, you know. It leaves. Bones get broken, you know. It's changeable. Your mind can change. You can change your thoughts, change your life. You know, mm -hmm. it's changeable. But, you know, this thing is getting ready to die. Let me plug this up right quick. It's changeable. So, while it's changing, it's an illusion. Because it can change From one moment at a time. So. I'm just saying. I'm going to get off of here. I don't know. Maybe. Freshen up my house or whatever. Like I say. I don't know. Many me. It stopped raining. So maybe I got to go get her. <laughs> I didn't want to be out there. In that flood. With uh. You know, that concert is tonight. I didn't want to be stuck in that flood with people and in all that water and all that. I just didn't want to deal with that. So, I don't know. Maybe I'll go out tomorrow, but I might probably going to have to go get her and a few. But like I said, I just wanted to come on here and do a Shabbat study on spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare attaches to something that's in you. It's a breach in you. It's something that's in you. It's influenced by something in you, be it negative or positive. Um, spiritual warfare comes to break you down. It comes to break your heart, basically, because if your heart is broken, you get depressed and you don't want to do nothing. Jesus was depressed in the garden of the cinnamon. You know, he was oppressed. He was burdened by the thought of what he had to do. He had been here, you know, 33 years. Well, 30 years and he started ministry. And three years worth of ministry, he'd been here. And as you know, the rubber meet the road, he started to come down to the end of it. You know, his flesh was oppressed. It was Hard. He had to go to his father and speak to him. Um, God sent an angel to strengthen him. That's the, you know, you got to get to the word. You got to stay strengthened. You know, there are things that you're going to have to go through that you're going to need strengthening. You can't just get up every morning and go through life like you got it all. Because I know it's the same old devil. And we always say he ain't got no new tricks. But if he keep pounding that same thing over and over and over in the same place, if he keep tempting us in the same area, we can relapse. I'm just saying. Don't think that you got it so good, so big, so bad. 
that ain't nothing shake you. You know, we living in a season where even the very elect is being deceived. How was that? Judas was one of the very elect, one of the very elite. That and he was deceived. Satan was able to get in on the inside of him because Satan saw that he was sick of looking at Jesus. He was sick of, you know, being subservient. Didn't want to, you know, he wanted to be the head HNIC. He wanted to be the one in charge. Satan saw that. He saw the iniquity in his heart. That's your breach. That's where the enemy comes in. Jealousy, envy. It's witchcraft. That's where when you want it bad enough, you will allow him to come in and betray your sister or your brother. And then you got to pay for that. You got to suffer the consequences. And it's never worth it. It really isn't. It's never worth it to hurt a child or, you know, a child of God. It's never, it's never worth it. I don't care. Leader, a saint, I don't care. It's never anybody. It's never worth it to hurt anybody. We supposed to walk in love. When you walk in spirit and in truth, you walk in love. That love resonates with others. You know, you know those, the spirit bears witness because they resonate with you. You can see the reflection, your reflection, God's reflection in them. If you look at somebody and you don't receive the reflection of God in them, you need to stay away. If you can't lead them to Christ, you stay away. It ain't for you. Don't, you know, don't keep nobody in your life just to pull you down. Beat on you. Talk about you. Mistreat you. Make you suffer. Use you. That ain't the love of Christ. That ain't what God, that's not God. God is love. And if God is love and we walk in love and God is the spirit, the Holy Spirit is on the inside of us, God is right here. He ain't in the clouds. He ain't all around in the sky. God is here. He's in our heart. We become one. John 15 talks about the vine. Abide in him and I abide in you. That means God is right here. But if you are walking with somebody or listening with somebody and you don't resonate that God is in their heart with them in right here, they ain't got God. If they ain't got peace, they ain't got God. If they sitting there trying to take stuff from you and, you know, Luke uh, 638 say give. God don't take. It say give. If they got to come up on you and try to take, that ain't God. It's just not. Love gives. Love doesn't rape. Love doesn't hurt. Love doesn't come against people. That's the enemy. Love doesn't have to hurt. Yeah, it may hurt when you see somebody go away that you don't want to go away for a long time. It'll hurt when people die. But you rejoice because if you know they were in Christ, if you know they were in him and you're in him, then you're going to see them again one day. That's love. Scriptures say we supposed to cry when they come in. Bringing in children nowadays with the world, the world is going now. We dealing with this, but these children, they're going to have to deal with something greater. Something worse. That's why I'm glad my tubes is tied. I can't have no more. If I ever got married, I don't have to deal with that. I don't have to deal with raising no more children. Not of my own anyway. I wouldn't even want to birth another child into this world the way it is the way it's going because we are in the last days. And I know we say that a lot, but we can generally see it that this is the last days. This is the worst as it's ever been. We got so much corruption in the government, which we knew, but now they don't care. They exposing it. They showing us 
that we've been subservient to a corrupt government. I'm going to get off of that. But they doing things that's killing people. We got to protect our heart. Guard our heart. We got to protect our spirit. We can't stay here forever. All of this is going to pass away. So, I want to tell you, protect your heart. Guard your heart. The spiritual welfare, you can't stop it. It's going to come. It comes to promote you. It comes to elevate you. It comes to test you. It strengthens you because what you go through, it strengthens you. I want to say protect your heart. Guard your heart. You can't stop Judas from coming. You can't stop from being heartbroken. You know, we be heartbroken more than one time. Jesus died of a broken heart. Who are we? So, guard your heart. Make sure you got your full armor on. Make sure that you're ready to meet him at all times. Because you don't ever know. You can go out here and just breathe a thing. They got so much going on. Like I said, I'm going to get off of that. But you can actually go out here and literally breathe and find yourself in the grave. We didn't have to deal with that before. We got to pay attention to the signs of the times. We got to educate and train up our children who are looking to us. We got to pay attention to our children. So much as, oh, we ain't going to have to worry about a legacy. But make sure they make it in. Make sure they know Christ. Make sure they know God. Make sure that they soul have a chance. Y'all stay blessed. I wanted to pop on here again because I forgot to say something. There was one point that I kind of disagree with Pastor Daniels because he said that I didn't even need you. He was talking about Judas when Judas betrayed Jesus, you know, of all the people that he could betray, that he could come against. He came against the one that provided for him, that was provision for him, that, you know, the son of God, you know, the one that, you know, that everybody been waiting on all this time to walk the earth and he want to come against him. And he said that I didn't even need you of the 12. Well, I beg to differ because the rest of them, they were good. But Judas was the one who propelled him and did the thing that got him to where he needed to be to accomplish the task that he was to, to accomplish. So when the enemy comes against you, when those that come and stab you in the back or that, you know, like I, say, I always say your Goliath, behind your Goliath is your door. You know, the ones that come to promote you, the ones that come against you, the ones, those are the ones you should call your friend. Those are the ones that propel you into the destiny that God has for you. Cherish them. Cherish the moments when you get the devil's attention. When people come against you, you know, and they do all manner of evil against you. Because when you get the devil's attention, that means you walking in the foots of God, in the steps of God. You are on the path of righteousness. You are doing what God has called you to do. Because you ain't going to get the devil's attention if you in his you know, backyard playing along with him. So when the enemy rises up against you, that's the one. That's the disciple that was the most important. Because he was the one to allow him to get back to God, to fulfill his purpose, to fulfill the call that God called him to do. 
Y'all stay blessed.